All right, so um, Jens asked me to talk about L5S1. We've gone back and forth, um, at least the literature's gone back and forth, and people have gone back and forth over, well, that doesn't move much anyway, why don't we just do a fusion there? Um, and, and, you know, that, that it does move less than 4.5, but is there an advantage? And, and I'm going to go over kind of when we think there is, when we think there isn't, and then where it's kind of a flip of the coin and it's, it's dealer's choice. So the goals are the same for TDR or, or a fusion, and, and I'll kind of limit it to, to ALIF here because it's the most equivalent, um, uh, which is obviously to reduce pain, um, restore disc height, secondary neuroforaminal height, secondary indirect decompression, um, and uh, function, and improve function. Done with, interestingly enough, with a 180 degree different philosophy, difference in philosophy. So one is to eliminate motion, one is to maintain or restore or improve motion. So why disc replacement? So we've heard over the last day, day and a half, numerous studies, it's a robust literature. Uh, now with randomized studies out 10 years plus, variety of methodologies, multiple countries, multiple continents, and it found that disc replacement produces outcomes similar, uh, and in fact, many times superior to fusion, and has a, at worst, similar, but again, most of the time, lower reoperate. rate. And it's less expensive than fusion, and, and, and one of the cost studies that I always um, quote is when, when we looked at all the different fusion constructs, the only fusion construct that was less expensive than a disc replacement is, an, is a standalone anterior inner body fusion with autograft. And think about that. We've never, most of us have never seen that in our life because that requires a harvesting of the crest, you know, multiple, multiple strips from the crest. So uh, most of the studies discuss uh, the indications and, and stress that the favorable outcomes for disc replacement infusion aren't appropriately selected patients. And obviously, we talked about that as well, selection, selection, selection. Um, not all patients that are appropriate for lumbar discogenic pain surgery are appropriate for disc replacements. There are contraindications. Fusion, well established. It's appropriate for patients with significant instability. Maybe a good option for surgeons not experienced with disc replacement. And disc replacement does require more precise implant positioning. When fusion? Well, in my mind, it's when the patient's not a good candidate for disc replacement. Um, I'm not sure if, I, if we go over it in this, in this talk, but we did a, a little retrospective study just looking at um, a consecutive series, of, I think it was 350 patients that came to the three of us at TBI for disc replacement and what percentage of them actually got it versus had contraindications. And my gut feel is it would be about 50-50. It was about 60-40, about 40% of patients that, that seek a consult at a disc replacement center really have contraindications. We did the same study with cervical and it was only about 20% had contraindications. And I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know. Um, the, there are more contraindications in the lumbar than in the uh, cervical. <clears throat> so the consequences of not preserving motion, um, from a basic science point of view, there have been papers that show increased interdiscal pressure and hypermobility at the adjacent segment. We're talking 5.1, so we'll be talking about 4.5 in this case. And some authors have even suggested adjacent segment disease involving the SI joint. So what about 5.1? So some argue that there's no point in preserving motion at 5.1 because there's little motion there anyway. Um, steep sacral angle may not accommodate the disc replacement. Um, could cause impingement on the posterior portion of the implant. And with the steep sacral angle, the increased shear may increase the chance of displacement. So is this true? Um, in TDR studies, 5.1 is the most frequently replaced level. So we've got all this data showing at worst non-inferiority and at best superiority to fusion, and most of these patients are 5.1 patients anyway. So are we, investigators and surgeons, are we missing something? 
Um, there's, this is a study done by a, a friend of ours, Boyle Chang, in uh, Pittsburgh, and he provided uh, information on range of motion in adults from three clinical and biomechanical studies and found that the range of motion ranged from 5 to 11 degrees. Um, looking at the lumbosacral junction, is there a critical sacral angle? And I think we talked about that either last night at dinner or, or in the conference. Um, sacral slope and pelvic inclination were measured pre and post op. Um, and uh, the investigators looked at a relationship, and, there, and it, it really, there really was no uh, critical angle. Now, some of us do believe that there is a critical angle, and we've, we've gone between 35 to 40 to 45. Um, different, different experienced people say differently. Um, anatomy. So um, there's no association between sacral slope, pelvic incidence, BMI, and outcomes from this study. So the study conclusion was that the disc replacement provided pain relief and functional improvement for a wide variety of sacral slope angles and suggested that steeper angles are not a contraindication. So one paper that supports one. So the, the, the jury's out on that. And, and even within this room, we disagree on which, what, what angle, which sacral slope beyond which would we really not consider doing a 5-1. Um, this is Chris uh, CP's paper, and this was 51 patients uh, with long-term follow-ups, almost eight years. Um, their their, their post-op over seven to eight years declined from 6.8 degrees to 4.4 degrees, um, but the clinical outcomes didn't decline over the same period. So with decreased range of motion over time, it didn't impact uh, the results uh, at 5.1, and this was done with the single disc, which was done with ProDisc L. For those of you finite element analysis junkies, uh, of which I'm not one, um, the, this paper, um, which was also this is in the Journal of Biomechanics, we all read this one, right? Um, that distraction reduced range of motion and facet joints. So we're talking about distraction. So anterior disc replacement um, decreased range of motion. Posterior placement increased facet joint forces and ligament capsule forces, and too high a disc, too much distraction, increased facet joint forces as well. <clears throat> Another study comparing single level 4, 5, and 5, 1 disc replacements. This was a smaller series, um, and, and again, uh, no difference between the two. So 5, 1, in terms of results, seems to, uh, seems to maintain uh, comparability to 4, 5, which everybody agrees is a good level. This was the study I was just talking about, um, and this was all comers, not just 5, 1, but, you know, in our hands we found uh, about a 60, 40, or maybe maybe two-thirds, one-third ratio. And then these are self-selected patients, so obviously it doesn't reflect the general kind of organic spine practice, walk in from your local community or referred in type patients. So. At, at TBA, when, when do we not do a TDR? Um, we looked at these, you know, kind of do, dove deeper into a little bit of these patients. They were older patients, again, not surprising. Um, and in those patients, we see more contraindications like advanced facet joint changes, facet joint ankylosis, facet joint instability, um, severe central stenosis, and significant osteophytosis. I think we all agree that, sp that spondylolisthesis, you don't even think about disc replacement. Um, this, is a, this is a fusion case. Um, end plates. Now, we, we've, we've gone back and forth on end plates. And as Jack mentioned yesterday, when we first kind of thought in this, I think it was when we were first pass on the active L paper, uh, Jim Yu was really into end plate morphology and things like that. And it turns out it really kind of didn't make a difference. Uh, Retrolisthesis is, is, is shown in one of Jack's cases. A lot of our patients, when they have vertical collapse, um, will have a retrolisthesis, and many times you can um, correct or at least partially correct the retrolisthesis with uh, distraction. Bridging osteophytes. Now, <clears throat> with all respect to Todd, we're not taking down fusions uh, to do uh, disc replacement, particularly ones that occurred by nature. So, you know, this, the bridging osteophyte would be a contraindication. So, in our hands, the most common reasons for not performing a disc replacement were degenerative issues that compromised either stability or functionality. Either they moved too much, a spondy, or they didn't move at all. Nature already fused them. 
Um, we also looked at, and I, I know I don't have that in this talk, um, intraoperative conversions. Are there intraoperative factors when you get in there and it's like, you know, oops, this isn't the right thing to do. As Jack mentioned, we consent all our ADR patients uh, for possible ALIF, and every patient asks about it, and the rate is less than one in 100, and invariably the patient that asks the most about it, they'll be the one in 100 that you know, has some intraoperative factor. But you, know, you gotta do what's best for the patient, and, and if they've got an incompetent end plate, uh, a large Schmorls node where the, the, the tray would not be stable, you've gotta do what's best for the patient. Scoliosis, in the original uh, ProDisc and Charité studies, and, and we kept the same indications for the active L, it was uh, greater than 11 degrees. Uh, it's a contraindication. In, in practicality, we've kind of gone, cut that in half. And, and if somebody is tending towards more than five degrees, particularly through the segment that you're, you're thinking of doing, um, we'll probably stay away uh, from disc replacement. Uh, again, end plate morphology, this is what I had in the lab today. That little hooked end plate, which prevents you know, the posterior positioning, which is seen here in this pro disc. I think you just have to do a little bit extra carpentry. Early in, this, early in our experience, you know, it may have made us shy away from disc replacement. Now we just know that when we're preparing the end plate, you've got that fine line between reshaping that posterior hook and violating the, uh, the cortex, because that's you know, the uh, rim is... Oh. Okay. All right. And you, and you can see that this is the same thing with the, with the Charité as well. And what happens is if you don't get that end plate all the way back and, and you're and not in the cortical rim, the, the weakest part of the bone is in the center of the disc space. You've got to get the end plates on the cortical rim. Really collapsed disc space. I know we were asked that um, in the lab. And as long as the facets are reasonable, with the tools that we have now, and you, you saw two of the tools in the lab, one is uh, individual paddle spreaders or the central spreader, the so-called David spreader, we're pretty much able to mobilize these. Um, nobody would recommend doing this for your first or first five cases, but <clears throat> once you're used to it, you can pretty much mobilize any disk space. And, and here's, I know I'm, I wasn't allowed to show any your complications, but I can show you some of your good cases, Jack. This is. Um, here we go, um, talking about a contraindication. You've got a facet cyst here. You've got fluid in the facet joint. That's obviously a sign of instability, um, and, and this is a contraindication. All right, recurrent disc herniation. They're some of our best patients, unless the uh, initial decompression was a bit aggressive and took the whole facet off. <clears throat> if the facet's off, that's, that's a, that's a no-go. Um, so you just we do CT scans preoperatively on all these. Well, we do them on everybody anyway for <coughs> for doing <coughs> excuse me accurate measurements, but particularly in, in post lamy patients to look at the extent of bony decompression. Osteopenia again something that is uh, more seen and and contraindicates more patients in lumbar than probably anything uh, of any of the other factors um, and. Uh, all the discs are labeled for T-score better than negative 1.0. So osteopenia is a, a contraindication. Uh, again, anatomic consideration. This doesn't contraindicate a patient to meet a disc replacement, but it, it, as one of the questions was in lab, it may decide whether you want spikes or a keel or a pro disc or an active L. I mean, these are things that you, you do in your preoperative planning to, to do the device that's best for the patient. We already talked about this one, um, preoperative sizing. You, you don't want to overstuff the disc space. They're not going to move. Um, interesting, and, and, and there really is almost no data on this, is you know, when, when disc replacement first came up, <clears throat> it was the, the opposite of, of PJK, it's distal uh, junctional failure of a scoli fusion. Is there a place for preserving motion? And I know that one of our uh, old partners who's moved on did some some scoli patients and did pro disc below uh, scoli fusions, but not enough to really draw any conclusion. And uh, you know, there's a study to be had there, but I don't really have an have an answer. It's it's kind of asking a disc to do a lot if it's below a seven, eight, ten, twelve level fusion. That's a long lever arm. So you know, I don't know. Um, also, you know, if, if the scoliosis includes that lower segment, then, you know, you're asking a disc to do something it really wasn't designed to do. So, little data. 
So by conclusion, many patients are good candidates for TDR at 5.1. We do it all the time. And the studies, as mentioned, the more than 50% of the patients in the one-level studies and in the two-level studies, for that matter, included 5.1. So there is motion at 5.1 that's worth preserving. Uh, Jack's study on adjacent segment in the ProDisc uh, showed that, that uh, it's worth preserving. Um, and, and motion's gained, it's maintained. Uh, you need to consider the anatomy in terms of, of, of either picking your prosthesis or contraindicating uh, disc replacement. Uh, fusion still indicates not going away, severe degenerative changes, spondies, um, end plate morphology where you don't think your, your trays will be stable, um, not enough data for, for uh, distal junctional failure of scoliosis, and it's preferable when, when it's clearly indicated or if you're in doubt. I mean, this, the safer play uh, is, is a fusion. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Anybody have any comments or questions? This is a, you know, this is a fortunately, this is a disc replacement friendly crowd yeah. because 5-1, you know, you, you can get some yeah, folks see, that just say it's just not worth doing. Right. We both heard that at national meetings, you know, mm -hmm. or big crowds where people will stand up at a podium and say, no point in doing it at five one because it doesn't move. But even That's even, not what even the data shows. yeah, and even really really early data. Um, you know, Russell Wong's from Special Surgery on some original ProDis patients said that in his paper was if it moved five degrees or more, there was no adjacent segment. If it moved less than five degrees, there was an adjacent segment at the same rate as a fusion. So you know, motion does make a difference. So yeah, but. I'm going to say just a comment is, is I've been impressed. Like you showed one of the class disc at five one, and a lot of people would say, okay, why you know really why put an artificial disc? I've got to say I've been impressed recently. We've been doing some EOS after artificial disc, and it's surprising how much lordosis you can regain from that 5-1 level, mm -hmm. just like you would do in an A-lift, right? Um, I, I almost get the feeling that the lordosis, you know, I'm almost concerned it's almost too much lordosis. I almost feel that you gain more lordosis from a mobile implant than you do from a fixed implant for mm -hmm. some strange reason. Um, and, you know, I want to know for you kind of, you know, obviously we can put an 11 degree, we can put a six degree, how do you choose? Like, I, I've seen some cases where I, I'm almost going to six because I'm trying to not give him lordosis, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm trying to. So how do you choose between a six and 11? And, and are you always an 11 if you get it? Or I mean, how do you make that decision? You know, it's interesting that the, the obviously the two discs that we've got in the U.S. have different different biomechanics. One's a ball and socket. One's a partially constrained sliding core. And, and, you know, I was influenced, again, by Chris Seepy on his study that, that we were overlordosing with the ProDisc at, at 5.1. So when I do ProDisc, I almost always just do the, the six degree. Mm -hmm. Now, with the active L, because it, and again, I don't have any hardcore data on this. It's just experience. The 11 degree doesn't seem to overlordose it. And, and I think it's something to do with the... the mobile core. I think it may be that it's a, I use the 8.5 almost mm -hmm. exclusively. So I'm using, when I do an active L5 one, almost always 11 degrees pro disc, almost always six. But, but the I mean, active L you're going 8.5. Active L I'm going 8.5 yeah. and there's, and obviously pro disc is 10. So. Yep. Just like in the cervical spine, I think in the lumbar spine, it's just by anterior column height restoration, you're basically pushing that spine into lordosis. So that makes a difference. The other comment I was going to make, back in the day when we used to go to Europe to do Moby days with LDR, uh, Professor Stive and his colleagues would, they would do actually actual demo with the Moby lumbar disc. And they had really good data in terms of long-term follow-up and look and see w which patients had the best clinical outcomes. Guess which one it was? The discs that were most collapsed pre-op. Post-op, those patients did amazing, you know, compared to, you know, juicy standard disc with annular tear, et cetera. So I think, again, whether it's five degrees or six degrees, you know, or, you know, whatever it is, I, you know, for all of us agree here, like, why not preserve whatever motion you have there, you know? Yeah, you know, Dr. Mornay very simplistically at the beginning said the spine will find its own center of balance. Sure. 
Uh, but, and I think coming full circle, that's right, because if we've made a mistake and we've overlord dosed, then we should be seeing a lot of failures with posterior edge where we don't see that, you know? So, uh, you know, maybe they correct and come back or, or it just shows that just measuring angles and putting in a static implant maybe satisfies our mathematical selves, but it's not what the patient's spine really wants, yeah. you know? So uh, that's, that's why we're all- I mean, if you're doing a lordotic feeling, right? You basically are locking that patient in. You better kind of have your best estimate of whatever that angle needs to be. You're doing all these complex calculations, but you also, you just, told us, which I think was your paper, Bay with Delmarter, you know, pelvic incidents and safe soap didn't matter as far as the outcomes, because yep. you put in a mobile implant and patient finds their natural balance. And plus, patients don't stay in that same position all day. They mm -hmm. sit, they slump, they yep. stand. Um, and, and people have measured the angle, like Pat, Pat Warden or someone measured angles in sitting patients versus standing yeah, patients. It, so it's Pat at Warden. some point during the day, they're overstressing what you've dialed mm -hmm. in. Isn't it better to let them yeah. self-adjust to some degree? Sit, so, stand, well, slump. You know, we've all drink mm -hmm. from the same fountain here. So. <laughs> yeah, we even hear the Scully guys at TBI talk about in patients that spend more time sitting than standing, they're now under correcting yeah. rather than doing the perfect, you know, matching of, you know, PI and We're all sitting around going, wow, you, you guys are so smart. <laughs> <laughs> We're all so smart. Either that or, or not.